thank you so much for the invitation uh, and I'm really uh, honored to be invited and I like nothing well the thing I like most is seeing patients the thing I like second most is being able to sort of share knowledge with uh, with families and colleagues and carers so this is really a, a lovely way to spend uh, my Friday um, so thank you very much for the invitation um, so I'll share my screen if I may and as you absolutely correctly said um, one of the big challenges in doing a talk like this is that if I was trying to do it uh, strictly speaking on uh, the grounds of what's published I would have very little to say to you I could do this talk in three minutes and you could listen to Ed Sheeran again but actually what we need to do is to think about the experience that we have gained and that we can pick up from what's out there I'm hoping you can see the slides if somebody can give me a nod or say something just to perfect good okay lovely and I'll put this onto um, screen then. Um, so, as I say, this is mostly based on experiential um, uh, situations and also based on um, what we can infer from other conditions. So we do have some, um, some slightly better data from other forms of neuromuscular disease, and we can try and infer that and try that into practice. Um, I'm lucky that I'm able to be joined um, by Zoe Davidson um, and we've had a discussion beforehand and Zoe is going to mostly cover aspects of assessment of nutritional status and then the dietetic uh, approaches that can be taken to very specific conditions that we see in young people with Duchenne's. So I will leave that part of it out, but plainly there's a complementary role that uh, colleagues like Zoe uh, and colleagues like myself and, and our team undertake in same patients. And in some ways, everything I say to you now is going to be based on team work. So this is not me presenting stuff other than being the, apologies for my dog. You have a bit of real life of what's happening in London, um, uh, of, what, uh, of, the, of the kind of teamwork approach that actually is the only way to succeed um, uh, with young patients like this. And I, I present these first couple of slides because I think they are helpful but not helpful. So those of you who are familiar with the, um, the various guidelines that have been drawn up for care will have seen this. And of course, uh, it is very much that model which is correct. And the useful part of this is the idea of the patient and the family being at the center of care yeah. with all of us providing a holistic approach to everything around it. Um, but the thing I would say that is difficult about this is that it makes everything seem somewhat, all the interconnected, somewhat non-overlapping. And the reality, of course, is that as um, the, the mother from Australia explained, there are aspects of steroid stuff which overlap with the GI things, there are aspects of respiratory stuff that you've heard about which overlap with uh, GI um, things, there's GI things which overlap with, so when people get very bloated, their ventilated, uh, ventilation status deteriorates. So all of this is rather more interconnected and overlapping than it makes out with this diagram, but it points to the point, the fact that there are some evidence-informed interventions and assessments we can take. And I guess the other thing to point to this is from this same document is this notion that the idea is that if you can monitor for weight um, by age, um, that is a key aspect of this. And I think certainly what Zoe will touch upon is that aspect of over and underweight, uh, which needs to be accounted for. But I would like to just take a trip through the GI tract uh, to try and touch upon the things that we know are uh, common occurrences and what we can do about that. And I'll just begin, if I may, with two slides of physiology. And sorry for those of you who are not very, uh, I think you're all on here because you're interested in how the body works. But I think the gut is, has always struck me as a kind of a slightly mysterious uh, thing. You, you put food into the top end and something magical happens for you to get nutrients out of it. And then something equally magical happens for you to get rid of the waste from the bottom end it's like you know it's like we don't really know how it works though for most of uh, this it's like the opposite of a washing machine where you put clean things in and get dirty things out of the bowel and the other way around with your washing machine we don't really know what the mechanics of it are and for me the one of the fundamental points of this is to understand that your gut has exquisite control of things um, of everything that goes through it. If you look at simply managing fluid, and this is a really big issue uh, with Duchenne people as they get towards later years, um, 
that ability to regulate fluid becomes fairly critical as uh, as dependency becomes greater. And there's a lot of liquid going through your gut. If you add up the amount of stuff that's in your feed, plus the amount of saliva we produce a day, plus the various juices that come from our digestive system, there's about 10 liters sloshing through our gut in a day. And of course, in health, we only produce about 100 mils out of our bottom end. So that 10 liters and circulating in our gut is exquisitely controlled uh, to allow only about 100 mils out every day. And if that flux goes wrong, then we get to situations where you can get more or less constipated, more or less diarrhea. And as well as looking at the liquid aspects of this, there's also a critical function, which is to do with um, the nutrients we absorb. So we'll, we'll be absorbing you know, tiny quantities, fractions of a particle of certain minerals and vitamins, and they'll be, we'll be absorbing great grams, you know, tens of grams of, hopefully, of protein uh, and carbohydrate and so on. So there's a situation of extremely variable control, but extremely fine control. And I guess in the purpose of a presentation like this, in terms of um, alerting us to what we should be thinking about, there are, I would say, sort of four things for us to think about when we need to get input for the top end of the digestive system. The fairly obvious one is obviously weight loss, which we don't intend. Um, so if somebody has lost weight, and in particular, the kind of magic number um, at which we should be looking to intervene is between 8 and 10%, we should be uh, aiming to keep an eye on that, not obsessively weighing, weight doesn't change that quickly, but to keep an eye on that in terms of just saying, okay, and just keeping a track, you know, um, and just making sure that there is a, a maintenance of weight. So, you know, work out what your baseline weight is, and then think what is 10% less than that, okay, I'll keep an eye, if that falls below that, that's when I need to do something about it. Prolonged meal times is a very early sign we should be interfering or at least getting assessments on. If meals are taking, in theory, longer than half an hour, and of course we have to put into fact that sometimes we get into habits and routines of eating slowly, watching the telly, playing with the iPad, but if there is something longer than that, and if there is sort of tiredness associated with meal times, that's a feature that digestion is or swallowing is taking more effort than it should be. Swallowing should be fairly naturalistic once you pass that uh, vocal cord uh, part at the top of your throat. Once you get past that into your esophagus, it should be fairly straightforward. Again, fairly obviously, I guess, having a, a lot of drooling should make a signal about need to get some input. But also, if the quality of the child's voice uh, changes, that's really something which is again is a warning sign. Of course, there'll be other respiratory complaints or adenoids or whatever else which may interfere with that. But just think about that as a more persistent feature. Um, and of course, plainly, when there's uh, unfortunate catastrophic events occurring, like aspiration, then that is obviously a signal of a very silent aspiration of content in there. Um, and in reflux, I almost don't discuss because, in my experience, it's almost ubiquitous. In the children and adults I see, uh, reflux is so frequent, partly related to posture, partly related to um, the changes in abdominal girth that occur, uh, partly related to being in prolonged seated positions. All of this contributes towards the slackening of the, uh, the low esophageal sphincter, the, the, the valve at the bottom of the gullet, which allows content to easily swoosh up into the chest. And that content can be food or it can be acid. Um, and I, again, I don't want to touch upon what Zoe will talk about, but I just wanted to point this to the generalist perspective of why we interfere with nutrition. Once we've assessed swallowing, if we're going to interfere with nutrition, it's either to provide missing content for this, those very finely balanced absorptions that you're not getting, that I mentioned earlier on, or it's because a very small number of young adults go into severe intestinal failure. In my experience, with Duchenne's, there's only been one young man who's gone into full intestinal failure. A lot of uh, patients go have problems where their restrictive eating becomes a problem, but that isn't truly a failure of their gut. It's more the eating behaviors that we have failed to intervene in at an early enough stage. And then that's become more fixed. And then the gut becomes less able to tolerate variation. You need variation in dietary intake if possible to keep your digestive system working healthy. It, wor it works best when it's given more variety uh, to work with. Um, Obviously, we aim to prevent any complications which occur from malnutrition. And, and, you know, food, digestion, nutrition is part of quality of life. When you eat well, you're able to interact with those around you. and It's an enjoyable experience. The other bit of physiology I said I'd share is something about the lower gut. And I present this because I 
I want, we don't do this test on, on anyone other outside of the research setting, but I wanted to just show how that washing machine of your gut works. This is a trace of a, in fact, this top trace is one of my research fellows who had the misfortune to come under my, uh, my supervision. And so we passed a tube via his uh, bottom end into his bowel, and we measured pressures at various points in his gut. The cecum that's mentioned there is the very top part of your colon, and the rectum obviously is the lowest part. So we had a tube measuring pressures throughout his gut, and we left it in there for 24 hours, from 2 o'clock one day to 2 o'clock the next day. And we measured the pressures. And what you see in a healthy individual like this young man is you see waves of contraction, these green hills, which sweep stools, poo, down from the right-hand side of your bowel all the way down towards the left. Sometimes it stops short, sometimes it comes all the way down. And when do you get these clusters of contraction? You get them after lunch, after dinner, and after breakfast. And in a healthy person, when you, when you go to sleep in the middle of the night over here, your bowel goes to sleep, everything is black. And there's very few contractions going backwards, retrograde. Most things are going forwards. And in this young man, uh, once or twice a day, he has a bowel action. So after breakfast, all these contractions, these green hills, brought some content down to his bottom. He had a bowel action there. He had a bowel action there after his lunch. Okay, so you can see what happens in health. Here's a patient with a neuromuscular disease. And that trace, the same kind of uh, device, um, the same 24-hour period from 2 o'clock one day to 2 o'clock the next day, could not look more different. Those two traces are utterly different. There is almost no peristalsis, there's almost none of these propagated contractions, very few green hills, lots of retrograde activity pushing content backwards, and the bowel is busy at night time. Okay, it's still working backwards, unfortunately, at night time. So this, it really reflects the problems and challenges that young patients with Duchenne and other neuromuscular diseases get, that your gut doesn't, doesn't coordinate to contract. The smooth muscle part of your intestine, this muscle that is not tr traditionally once thought to be involved, is very involved in this whole process. Now, if we jump back up to the top end of the gullet, you've got to remember that swallowing, as I said at the very start, is comp we have control of it, but it's complicated. I don't want to go through this slide, but I just want to illustrate by using this, this graphic, the idea of how complicated it takes it is to close off one part, open another part, do it simultaneously whilst you're breathing. Sometimes we do it whilst we're talking as well. Sometimes we do it um, lying flat. Sometimes we're doing it sitting upright. Sometimes we do it while we're concentrating on something. Sometimes we do it when we're not. Sometimes we do it with solid pieces. Sometimes with flaky pieces. Sometimes with liquids alongside that. It's complicated to manage all of that. Uh, yet we do it naturally. And when you see how complicated it is, you also see how easy it is to go wrong. The more complicated a system is, all of you who drive fancy cars with electrics, you know that just one thing makes the whole car stop good old days, um, good old cars, you know, it took a lot for it to stop working. But we can swallow and understand swallow mechanisms much better than we used to. We have these things which actually, although they sound horrible, are very well tolerated uh, by young and old patients. Uh, we pass a little catheter, the diameter and texture of a bit of cooked spaghetti via the nostril into the gullet and we can use it to measure pressure so we can see whether the problem is at the top of the gullet with the sphincter mechanism, is it in the middle of the gullet where the body of the esophagus, the gullet isn't squeezing properly, is there a lot of reflux in the bottom end causing things to, to become less contractile, is the sphincter closing inappropriately, and to our surprise when we started doing these to a few young uh, men with Duchenne's, we found uh, some disorders which we weren't expecting, we found one, one young man who had a condition also called achalasia, which uh, is a, a rarish condition, uh, and was surprised that this young man had achalasia, and we were able to treat his achalasia with an endoscopy and a, a stretching of that particular valve, and were able to make that diagnosis through this kind of testing and give him a definitive treatment for a coexistent problem. And I guess that's one of the things I'd like to sort of point out, which is probably fairly obvious, which is that one of the downsides of doing a talk like this is sometimes you think, oh, well, my son has also got this problem, so it's probably the same as that. But actually, it's worth getting assessed because just because somebody has Duchenne's doesn't mean they can't have the other things that happen to any of us. Um, so it's worth bearing that in mind. Not everything is a complication. And that kind of so-called diagnostic oversimplification is something that doctors in particular are very guilty of, but uh, we must just stay vigilant um, that we should think about these things laterally as family members and carers as well.
Um, so I've said all that, sorry. Um, I guess one thing I wanted to point out in this slide here was um, what I think is um, a rather important point, uh, which is that it's only a minority of patients who are underweight uh, when they need nutritional, nutritional input. Now, Zoe, you'll obviously talk about this in greater and more, more experienced detail than I can, but it's a minority of patients who, who have a reduced BMI at the point at which they need some input. I also want to point out with this slide, a third point there, that the presence of symptoms in the abdomen triggered by food doesn't necessarily mean that it's a food intolerance. And I'll talk about that in a second. Intolerances in the gut are most, mostly subjective. We know that when experiments are done, where a person who feels they're sensitive to one particular food or another gets given that food via a tube into their nose so they can't see it or smell it, um, and they get that compared with um, something of the same calorie density but neutral, that they get it right half the time and wrong half the time. In other words, it's a guess. So a true intolerance to food is very, is, is very, 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 very rare. People who think they're sensitive to, say, mushrooms, when you give them mushrooms without them knowing it's mushrooms, by squeezing it down a tube and saying it's either water or mushrooms, will guess wrong half the time, guess right half the time, same as if you tossed a coin. But what those symptoms cause, whatever they're caused by, uh, in real uh, allergies or, in, or more likely intolerances, is that they result in progressive changes in eating behavior. And those can gradually extend and extend and extend where we end up creating separate set of problems with weight loss and restricted eating, which can actually exacerbate the whole situation. Um, I said all that, sorry. Um, I wanted to then leave nutrition to Zoe, but talk about bloating. This is probably the thing that I, I find hardest to manage. You know, Duchenne's child, adult, carer say to me, my son, I have got bloating. I find that thing which I always think, oh goodness, I'm probably going to disappoint you here because it's a symptom which we, we think is related to abnormalities of how the abdominal wall stretches in relation to content. We know for sure that it is not due to excessive amount of gas for most people. When they feel bloated, and if we x-ray their tummy or do a CT or MRI of their tummy, they don't have excessive gas in most situations. Um, the bloating that occurs is due to the abdominal wall giving way and losing tension um, more often than it is due to anything abnormal in content. That's why it goes up and down so much. Uh, it's the muscle stretch in the abdominal wall rather than the contents of the gas in there. And one of the things that we can sometimes do is identify that patients have something called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. As I showed you with the esophagus, there's this abnormal contractions that can be seen in, this, in the gullet. And along with those abnormal contractions in the gullet, you can also get abnormal contractions further down in the intestine. And from your mouth down to your bottom end, it's about seven meters, seven or eight meters of tubing from your mouth down to your anus. And the largest part of that tubing, about four and a half, five meters of that, is your small intestine. And that's where all the magic of nutritional absorption occurs. But if that contraction is not occurring in a nice smooth coordinated way because as I showed you in the colon those pictures uh, the same thing happened in the small bowel if that doesn't happen then chunks of the intestine can go into standstill and that's a beautiful environment for bacteria because suddenly you've now got this nice warm place lots of delicious nutrients that you've eaten no movement little acidity being pushed through and therefore you have a perfect environment for bacteria to grow. And we can do tests, and this is a, a kind of cartoon, of a breath test we can do where we can give different kinds of substrate, different kinds of meal, and then measure the amount of carbon dioxide or hydrogen or methane that's produced. And that's a reflection of whether there's bacteria present. So this is a non-invasive test. It's not perfectly accurate, but it's a good worker day test that gives us an idea. And it certainly, it's even if it's not necessarily accurate in a population, it's very accurate for one individual. So for if one individual has a set of a reading, like this is what we see as a normal curve, if they have a curve like this and it suddenly changes from being this kind of curve, which is normal to this kind of curve, then we know that that's a sign of a positive test. What this shows for those of you who are interested is hydrogen or methane on that vertical axis. And in health, you and I, when we take a meal, about 
uh, two hours after we've eaten it, it reaches our colon and we get lots of production of hydrogen or methane. Whereas in somebody with bacterial overgrowth, because those bacteria are now colonizing this small intestine, which isn't moving and full of nutrients, when you give them a meal, within half an hour, 45 minutes, they produce a rise. So this is a positive bump very early on, as opposed to a normal bump there. And if it changes from here to here, that young person has got bacterial overgrowth, and we can then treat that. And there are very specific treatments. We used to have very old fashioned treatments in the old days, where we gave generic, generic antibiotics. We now have these more specific agents, which are not absorbed from the gut so well. So they're, they're therefore safer, they don't cause any renal or kidney problems, should I say. And, and they, they do what they say on the tin, they, they remove bacteria from the gut um, in a way that is, seems to allow them to be used um, in co short courses as and when needed. Now, I said I'd touch upon food intolerances, and one that's most often described is lactose malabsorption. And I put this figure up to say that actually, although as many as by one in five people in the UK think they have lactose malabsorption, the true incidence for this is nearer about 1% to 2% of the population who have it. So it's not 20% of people who have it, it's nearer 2%. And there's certain populations who are more at risk of lactose malabsorption uh, because they have a lower level of the enzyme that breaks down lactose. And that's people in sub-Saharan Africa and people in the far east of Asia. Um, so if your population of patients that you look after or your families uh, or have an origin from those parts of the world, then it is more likely. It can be up to about an average of about 50% uh, of populations have a degree of lactose malabsorption. But it's certainly much less uh, common amongst Caucasian patients. Not impossible, but much less common. And again, we can test for that with the breath test I mentioned earlier on. But the one thing I would say is that lactose exclusion is often not very helpful. Um, so I say, although a lot of people believe they're lactose intolerant, most of people don't actually have true lactose intolerance. Because to get lactose intolerance, you have to have a fair amount of lactose in your diet a day. It's the equivalent of all of this, and most of us don't consume that amount of uh, in these products in a day. So true lactose intolerance is often not really an issue, but it can be tested for if you're concerned that there's a predictable issue around this. Um, the extra slides I'd just like to run through before I move to constipation, if I may. I hope I'm doing a give a time, yes. Um, this is a piece of work we did in a multidisciplinary group where we tried to classify all the symptoms that occur in neuromuscular patients. Uh, so the upper gut symptoms, nausea, satiety, reflux, the abdominal symptoms, and the bowel symptoms. And what you see, and then we did that in the vertical columns, and in the rows, we looked at the assessment and then the first line, second line, third line treatments. And what I wanted to point out is this, that the first line thing to assess for all patients is their degree of constipation, because constipation is not just presenting as constipation. It can present as diarrhea, but it can be most commonly the cause of abdominal pain, the cause of reflux, of early satiety, of nausea and vomiting. So it's really, really important to consider those things before we go down the route of investigating young people and putting invasive tests into them. And for me, constipation is fairly simple to explain and understand and treat. To make your bowel work, from the analogy I use most often, it's like getting toothpaste from a tube. Your bowel has to be full enough to empty. You have to know that it's full. In other words, you have to get a sensation from that. You've got to squeeze the tube, which is those green hills I showed you in the contraction slide before. You've got to take the lid off. You've got to coordinate when those green hills are contracting with when your bottom and muscles relax. You can't, if you want to get the toothpaste out, you don't just squeeze the tube and leave the lid on. You've got to do the squeezing, then take the lid off or vice versa. And you've got to get a consistency of what's in the bowel, the right consistency. If it's too hard, it won't come out. If it's too soft, it'll leak out and cause accidents. So the, the thing about this is to then, how do I translate that into real life in terms of what does this silly analogy mean? It means that we need to think about getting the coordination of transit correct and the coordination of the MT mechanism correct. And Oftentimes, in my experience, in this and many other patient groups, asking patients a symptom, asking carers, isn't very helpful because, as Einstein told us, the thing that about memory is that it's deceptive. Memory will tell you the thing that's most recent or most dramatic. It doesn't tell you the, the fuller story. So we tend to use diaries, we tend to use visuals, which we can then help give us a better idea of what's happening. And that will often give us a clue about what the pattern is here in relationship to medications or meals or eating times or other external stresses. 
And the other aspect of this, which often we don't talk about, what we know affects a lot of young people with Duchenne's is incontinence. Sorry, should I show the full length there? Fecal incontinence or FI. Fecal incontinence is a really big deal for some of our Duchenne's patients. It's something they don't talk about or they tend to get used to just wearing pads because of their bladder. But actually it's a really disabling symptom. It's not good for your skin, but it's not good for your dignity and that sense of smell. And if you're participating in other activities with other people, you worry about this or your family worry about it. And there's many, many things we can do to try and contain this. We can contain the devices, the incontinence better with devices. We can focus on how the muscles work. We can focus on how the guts uh, contract and the sphincters relax. And in terms of treating this, we have a very well worked up pathway. This is mostly been done in spinal cord injury and MS, multiple sclerosis, but it's the same principles apply for neuromuscular disease. There are things at the bottom of the pyramid which help the vast majority of patients. We sometimes use more interventional therapies and we very rarely need to progress to more aggressive therapies shown in red. So for most patients we look after, they're looked after in that green zone. In my experience at Duchenne, it's about 80% in that green zone um, and about 20% who, who we use irrigation. We never go further up that ladder. And there are a number of things we can do. There are things we can do to tailor uh, what is, um, uh, which laxatives to use. Um, we, there are things we can do to help the evacuation, evacuation process. And there are things that we can do uh, with abdominal massage. Laxatives is a whole talk unto itself, but the point I wanted to make is that we shouldn't think of constipation as just one thing. Constipation is, from a doctor's point of view like me, something which is utterly different. There are different mechanisms that go wrong, as I said, not squeezing the tube, not having the consistency right, not relaxing the bottom muscles, some combination of those two or three things, presence of pain. There's a large number of permutations of things, and according to what there is, is it episodic hard stools? Is it occasional missed stools? Is it occasional change in frequency? Is it problems of infrequent urge? Is it a difficulty in emptying, a sense of an always feeling full? There are a number of things we can do and what we do then as therapy very much depends on which of those things it is. You can't have a laxative and say this is my favorite laxative, I always use that. That makes no sense. We see Duchenne's young men who have all of these symptoms on the left and we tailor the laxative therapy. So just saying, uh, oh, the GP gave me this laxative and it didn't work, so I don't think anything laxative will work. That's not right. Maybe they gave it the wrong laxative or they didn't use it in the right way or they didn't use the right stimulant alongside it. So we need to think carefully about the history in that. And my, my encouragement is to sort of go back to first principles. Lots of references there for your doctors to share and re read uh, what all this is based on, rather than necessarily making all of you colleagues um, as experts overnight as family members. And beyond that kind of laxative use, we also have, this is just a silly slide I did on a plane one day, a lot of new drugs that have come along beyond laxatives. Laxatives work on the bowel lining, and the problem with them is that your body can tolerate them. These newer drugs work on the bowel muscles themselves and have, can have more tailored effects. They act on very particular receptors in your bowel wall, or they, if you're taking other morphine-like drugs to manage pain, they're ones which, which block those effects. There are drugs which work on very particular receptors on the lining of the bowel, and all of this story, in other words, that I'm going to, can we can use much more tailored agents alongside some of these laxatives. So there's a therapies have changed in this area. I mentioned irrigation is that orange zone of the pyramid. There are these devices which have developed, uh, which some individuals use, or sometimes their carers use for them, to allow individuals to um, void their bowel. And there's our simple ones which can have a simple cone uh, uh, put against the bottom end, or more complicated ones with a catheter, but they all have the same principle, connected via some tubing to a water reservoir, either a small reservoir or a larger volume reservoir, either hand pumped or just by gravity feed, but a huge range of devices that are available and they can be tailored to the individual, what their particular setup at home is, what their toileting arrangements are, is it in a chair and a toilet, to actually optimize emptying with all this stuff. And if I show you what happens in a, you and I as, as healthy people, if we open our bowels, this is us beforehand, this is our stool in our bowel, lots of stool in there, it's got lots of poo in there. And when you empty your bowel, you empty out most of that left-hand side, but you still see, leave some in your rectum. A patient with it, this is a spinal injury patient, but exactly the same in neuromuscular disease. They don't empty out very much when they try and have a bowel action. How irrigation works is that it takes that, this is a, a spinal patient again, that's the bowel full. When you irrigate, you can you clear out that entire quantity. So instead of having, it's, it's better than even a normal individual's empty because you're clearing out the whole left colon. 
and certainly way better than a spinal injured patient otherwise would have. So you can see the significant quantity of irrigation that we, how well it works. So I want to leave you the idea that there are things we can do for continence, there are things we can do for evacuation. It depends on taking a very tailored history. Understanding that constipation underlies lots of upper gut symptoms, that bloating is very hard to manage, that reflux and difficulty swallowing can be approached but need very specific interventions around identifying this. And the principle I guess I'm trying to persuade you is that it's worth presenting with these things rather than always assuming that there's it's an inevitable part of living longer with Duchenne's. There are things we need to know. There are projects we're trying to get off the ground. Um, it hasn't been helped by having um, the pandemic to put a hold on all forms of other funding, um, certainly in our, in, our, in our work sector. We want to know how commonly does this occur? And a simple sort of survey of our patient, of our parents and families would be helpful for that. What do parents want and carers want? It's easy to look at this from a medical perspective and say, oh, well, we always do this, we always do that. But sometimes the things we can do, we shouldn't be doing as doctors and nurses. Um, I'll leave the nutritional questions to uh, Zoe to address some of that uh, in terms of the next two. Um, I think transition is a real issue as we move um, children into adult care. We don't really know what aspects of dietary patterns, what aspects of bowel function uh, we should be assessing in that transitional phase. And one of the questions that remains unknown is, should we be intervening earlier to optimize nutritional status to see whether we can actually improve cardiac and respiratory function in a proactive way, rather than waiting for troubles to develop and flying by the seat of our pants? So listen, I, I hope that's been of some overview use. Um, I'm really delighted to have joined and I'm really keen to answer any questions that arise.